in this last video I will explain how to construct uh, compact embedded CMC surfaces in S2 Crossar. So I will give two constructions. The first of them is the construction of arbitrary genus surfaces with H between 0 and 1 half. And, uh, well, in this case, the, the picture is like this. And if I want to produce a surface with positive mean curvature in S2 Crossar, here epsilon is equal to 1, then I have to start with a, a minimal surface in a Berger sphere of parameters 4H squared plus 1, and h. So in this uh, Berger spheres I will consider a geodesic polygon consisting of the three red horizontal geodesics h1, h2 and h3 and one vertical geodesic uh, joining the endpoints. So this polygon where these angles have been prescribed to pi over 2 and this last angle is pi over k exists in the Berger sphere and projects onto a triangle of like this via the Hopf vibration. So if I solve the plateau problem, because I can very easily find a mean convex body in which this uh, in whose boundary this uh, polygon is contained, then I conjugate and I obtain something like this. The first step in the construction is to find the points in which nu is equal to 0 and nu is equal to minus 1, because I am assuming that the angle function is negative. So in this case, I find that the uh, points with nu equals 0 are just those of the vertical geodesics. These are the vertical points of the surface. And the only point in which the only points in which the, the, the angle function is minus 1 are 2 and 3. So uh, this means that these red geodesics grow, uh, go up monotonically and they don't go back because they don't have points with nu equals 1. And also I know that this curve is convex because of the of the estimates of the curvature of the boundary that I uh, commented in the first video. So all in all I have that the conjugate surface is embedded and it is also a graph onto some domain of S2 via the usual projection. So well here there are a lot of details that I'm omitting but uh, the situation is more or less, more or less like this. So then here I have a degree of freedom that I can enlarge, for instance, the length of the geodesic H2, H2, and then by means of a continuity argument using Bolzano's theorem, I can fit by analyzing the different limits that this length L is equal to pi over 2. So this length in the projection is pi over 2, and then after successive reflections of this fundamental piece across the planes that span uh, the boundary components, then I can obtain a complete embedded CMC surface because the original piece is contained into some prism like this. In fact, for k equals 3, we have some picture like this when we have reflected the fundamental piece six times. So this is six copies of this fundamental piece with angle pi over 3. Then if we reflect again with respect to these components and we reflect again with respect to S2 cross 0, then we get 24 copies that form a genus 2 surface with any constant mean curvature constant between 0 and 1 half. In fact, when h goes to 1 half with a fixed j, then the surface converges to two tangent 1 half spheres. So this uh, next here uh, collapse two points along the equator and the, uh, the, the each part of the, of the surface converges to a 1 half sphere. So, uh, in the second construction, I will deal with 
the construction of embedded H tori in the space S2 cross R again. So I again I need to start with a surface in the VG sphere, but in that case the model that I didn't pay a lot of attention to the model in the in the in the previous construction will be a little bit more involved because I will consider the local model instead of the global model. Because well since the isometries since the, the, it is locally isometric to the Inverger sphere, then I can also do the Daniel sister correspondence and obtain a CMC surface in S2 cross R. So this is the model for this choice of the parameters. And then the construction, the, the initial polygon, is a bit more complicated than in the previous case. So this is a faithful depiction of the uh, initial geodesic polygon in this model. So I would like you to look at this last picture, which is um, one of, the, of the, the examples of this family. And this horizontal geodesic, H0, is a quarter of a whole horizontal geodesic in a Berger sphere. So this is just a quarter, uh, this projects onto a half of a great circle of the base S2 by the half vibration. Then, once I have fixed this X, uh, H0, then I place two horizontal geodesics which are orthogonal to H0 at uh, its endpoints. So one of them is uh, H1 that starts here, and in that case, this curve is a helix because it projects onto a great circle of S2. And then on the other end point, I start at 90 degrees, I start going again with a horizontal geodesic H2, but in the other direction. This means that, this means that H1 and H2 are two parallel helices and two parallel horizontal geodesics in the Berger spheres. So I can connect them by a vertical geodesic. So now we understand this picture, the parameter of my family of examples will be just the point at which I place the vertical segment V. So this is the case uh, lambda equal to 2 pi, then if I move it uh, along this geodesic, I get the case lambda equals 3 pi over 2, then if I move it further, I get the uh, case lambda equals pi, then if I move it further, I get the case lambda equals pi over 2, and then I can even move it further if I reverse the uh, geodesic H1. And then I go further, and then I get here a case where lambda is, is between 0 and 1 half, and then I get my final uh, polygon, which is lambda equals 0. And I say my final because even though I can go further, then I get examples that are isometric to these ones. So lambda starts from zero here, and then it reflects the angle of rotation of uh, the point one along the geodesic H1. So this is zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi. Okay, now I think we understand the, the, the geodesic polygons, and then I have to be careful and ensure that the uh, plateau problem can be solved. This is very delicate because in this case the, 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 the mean convex body is much more involved. In fact, the mean convex body I will use is just this cylinder that I have drawn here, which is minimal, it is a Clifford cylinder that projects onto a great circle of S2, and this gray helicoid that I have drawn here, in which uh, H1 and H2, and also H0, are contained. 
So using these two minimal surfaces as barriers, I can solve the plateau problem. But this surface I obtained, sigma tilde, lambda, is a graph. If and only if I am in one of these three cases above. Because in that case, this is what we call a Nietzsche graph, in the sense that the contour is made of horizontal and vertical geodesics that project onto the boundary of a domain in the base. This domain is half a disk here in the base. But in the cases below, when lambda is bigger than pi over 2, then this is no longer a graph because we have boundary components that project onto the same curve. Well, then in order to analyze the uniqueness of solution of the plateau problem, we see that, well, this is not a vertical graph. When it is a vertical graph, it is very well known that the solution is unique, but we find that it is a graph in the direction of another killing vector field. This killing vector field is associated to translations along the geodesics gamma, uh, H1 and H2. So in our model, this is, these are helicoidal motions that preserve this helicoid. So this gives rise to another killing, killing submersion structure, and in that situation we can apply the classical techniques based on the maximum principle to prove that this surface, the solution of the plateau problem, is a killing graph in the direction of this vector field x tilde. Okay, in fact, sigma tilde, uh, seen as a graph in this direction, is a solution to a Dirichlet problem over half a disk. This half a disk is again half of the disk here in the base. So we prescribe the value zero on one side of the half disk, which, which corresponds to the geodesic H0, and some continuous value on the other side that corresponds to the geodesic V. Here we will encounter at these two vertices two vertical geodesics that correspond to H1 and H2. But if we understand the surface as this solution to the Dirichlet problem for the minimal surface equation, then the solution is exists and it is unique. So it is very nice because we can also apply the continuity of the surface with respect to the parameter lambda. Well, now we understand the surface. Next step is to see, well, what is the behavior of the angle function? Well, there are two different cases. In the case when lambda is between zero and one half, then this is a, a, an schematic picture of the of the of of this situation here. And now, if we analyze the the, the the behavior of the normal, then we find that the only vertical points with nu equals zero are the points in V, and the the horizontal points where nu is equal to minus one. I recall that I am assuming that the angle function is globally negative. This is a vertical graph, so the angle function has a sign. Are two and three. So this is the same as in the case of the arbitrary genus surfaces. And here we will see it uh, better. In the case lambda bigger than one half, it is, um, it is much more involved. And now it is not a graph, so the angle function can, uh, should have zeros in the, in the interior of the, of the fundamental piece. And we see that the vertical points are Again, the vertical geodesic, because it is a vertical geodesic, and also it is a curve joining the vertical geodesic with the horizontal geodesic H0, whereas the horizontal points are only 2 and 3 again. Here, these arrows uh, indicate the normal at the corresponding points. How to discuss this? Because we don't know what is the surface, we just know the, 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 the polygon. Well. The, 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 usual, the usual technique to, to, to deal with the points, uh, horizontal and vertical points, is to compare the surface with surfaces which have nu equals zero or nu equals plus or minus one at the points. So the, the surfaces with nu equals plus or minus one are the so-called umbrellas. I will not go into the, those details. This is much easier. 
But in this case, to say that, to, to conclude that the, uh, there exists exactly, precisely one interior curve, delta, where nu is equal to zero, we have to compare to, with vertical uh, surfaces. These vertical surfaces, I have de depicted the, the three possible situations here, are the Clifford cylinders, which are everywhere vertical. So these are the pre-images pre of uh, geodesics in the base S2 cross R by the Hopf vibration. So they are just vertical cylinders in this model. Here in this uh, turquoise color, we find the intersection of the vertical cylinder, three possibilities of the intersection of the vertical cylinder with the fundamental region, the mean convex body in which we are solving the plateau problem. So we know the intersection of uh, sigma lambda and uh, the Clifford cylinder lies inside the turquoise uh, regions. Then we say, well, if there is a tangent, if there is a vertical point of the surface, then we place exactly the, the Clifford cylinder at that point, which is tangent to the surface at the vertical point. Well, now we analyze the intersection. It is very well known that the intersection of minimal surfaces is an equiangular set of curves going through the point. And at least there are two curves in the intersection because the two surfaces are tangent. So there is some kind of cross going through the point. But well, if also this first derivative of the angle function vanishes at the point, then there are, there are at least three curves. So when we are analyzing the angle function here, the zeros of the angle function, this nodal set, then we have to discard zeros of the gradient of the angle function because at those points, this curve, this hypothetical curve, should bifurcate, which means some situation that we don't like. So we would like only one curve here. Also, we have to discuss why there are no other curves. For instance, another curve joining one point here with another point here, or why there are not closed components. So I am not going into the details because this is very long and it is not difficult, but one has to be very careful because there are many different cases and many different behaviors that one should analyze. For instance, here I have drawn one vertical cylinder in some, say, um, uh, in uh, usual intersection, and here the intersection when it goes through the axis of the cylinder. So you should imagine that there are many possibilities and one has to analyze where all these curves in the intersection that show up uh, die. Well, once this is done, we can analyze the, the, the corresponding uh, conjugate surfaces. In the case lambda is equal to zero, then we get some very well-known example. We recovered the equivariant, the, the rotational invariant, H to I given by Pedrosa and Ritore. So in, that, in this case, the conjugate surface consists of three curves contained in vertical planes, and these curves are like this. So this surface is invariant under translations along these horizontal geodesics, geodesic which are rotations in S2. So this is rotational invariant, fundamental piece of uh, H to I. In the case between 0 and 1 half and, and pi over 2, then we have the H unduloids, which is something like this. I have drawn the vertical curve like this because I don't know what is the, the real shape. In the case lambda equals pi over 2, we have the equivariant H spheres, also described by Pedrosa and Ritore and we have one fundamental piece like this. In the case lambda bigger than one half, then we discover that the curve delta of zeros is transformed into some curve delta like this, and now we see that the, serve, the, the curve in the vertical plane and the curve in the horizontal plane should go back somehow, and, then, and they produce 
the neck of the nodoid. And then we have some picture like this. So here I have drawn some lens, mu1 and mu2, and L0, L1, and L2, that are the distances between the axes here and the points 1, 2, 3, and 4. And also the L0, which is the distance between these two vertical planes. Well, by means of comparing the solutions of the plateau problem along the common boundaries, we find that these distances are monotonic in the parameter lambda. We have to, to say that they are sine distance in the sense that, for, for instance, here the, the length mu1 is, has some value, then it decreases up to zero, and then it increases again. Well, because here it is negative and here it is positive because the angle function changes sine in the nodoids with respect to the, no, the, 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 the unduloids. So, well, they, they, they are more or less monotonic, but we understand them very well in terms of the parameter lambda, even though we don't know the explicit value of these functions. Also, it is very surprising from my point of view that the lengths of H0 and V remain constant and they do not depend on lambda. So these lengths are the same for the whole family. Also, they are the same as the lengths of the corresponding curves in the vertical Delaunay surfaces. So it's some kind of invariant of, of this space. Well, also, if when we want to, 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 to analyze what happens with the, with the vertical curves and to see what is the shape of these curves, then it is a very hard problem in, indeed. Because the usual technique is to, to, to analyze the projection of this curve and say, well, if the whole polygon projects one to one by the, by the projection onto the first factor, then the whole surface is embedded, the whole fundamental piece is embedded by the maximum principle. But this is very difficult to analyze. Also, in the minimal case, and in the classical uh, setting of minimal surfaces in Euclidean space, one fundamental tool is the so-called crust, uh, crust theorem. But this is not true in the, in the, in the, in the setting of uh, product spaces, so for, for each surfaces. So we cannot, we cannot use this tool either. So in order to analyze the embeddedness of these curves and the embeddedness of the fundamental piece, we have to develop a further, a further approach. And we will exploit the fact that the surface is a graph in the direction of this uh, killing vector field that I showed before. And this killing vector field, which is the, the I, 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 I repeat that this is it is associated to, to screw motions, which are translations along H1 and H2, is tangent to the surface along the curves H1 and H2 that now appear in orange. This means that in the corresponding fundamental piece, this function, if we consider the uh, sorry, if we consider the same intrinsic vector field in the fundamental piece, it will vanish, somehow it will be tangent in the orange components. If we reflect this fundamental piece with respect to these uh, two planes, the vertical plane and the horizontal plane, to make H0 and V disappear, we get with what I will call the fundamental annulus of the Delaunay surface, the horizontal Delaunay surface. In this fundamental annulus, I have that this vector field somehow, and now I will ex explain precisely how, is tangent along these two curves. Well, the way of doing this is to consider the function given by the product of the uh, killing vector field with the unit normal to the surface. So this is a function that now is defined on the surface and lies in the kernel of its stability operator, which is the linearization of the second fundamental form. But this, um, this stability operator, even though the, the correspondence is not intrinsic, it, it is actually intrinsic in the sense that it is preserved by the correspondence. This was proved, proved by Benoit Daniel, 
And now the function in the kernel does extend to the conjugate surface. So I can say that if this surf, if this function vanishes on the orange curves here, then it also vanishes as an intrinsic function on the orange curves here. So since it doesn't vanish in the interior, there are some computations behind, but I will omit them, then this means that I have a function in the kernel of the stability operator, which is a Schrodinger operator, and vanishing on the boundary. Then the classical elliptic theory says that this domain here has first eigenvalue of this uh, stability operator equal to zero. In fact, I can see that this is a maximal stable domain of the uh, of this surface. So this is something related to what with something I said in the introduction, that these surfaces will not be ever stable in, uh, as, as global surfaces. So now I can identify this killing vector field here. Why? Well, because this function that vanishes in the boundary, I can recover it as the function of another killing vector field now in s 2 I consider the killing vector field associated with translations along gamma. So these are rotations in S2 uh, uh, along this equator. Then this vector field also is tangent to the surface on these orange curves because the surface intersect these two vertical planes orthogonally. Then I can produce another function in the kernel of the stability operator that vanishes in the boundary. Then, again, by classical elliptic theory, one function must be a multiple of the other function. So this means that there is a constant A lambda, it depends on lambda, such that this function is a multiple of this function. So since this function doesn't... Um, uh, doesn't vanish in the interior, then this function cannot vanish in the interior either. So I find that this surface, this fundamental annulus, is a graph in the direction of this uh, vector field coming from rotations. So now using together that it is a graph, uh, sorry, uh, the fundamental piece this one is a graph in the vertical direction. It's, well, it is a multi-graph. I, I, I understand very well the angle function. Together with the fact that it is a graph in the direction of x, I can conclude that the whole fundamental annulus is, uh, uh, is embedded. Well, I will not give the details of this, but I would like to, 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 to comment one of the, of, the, of the points in the proof, which is the fact that, well, this fundamental piece projects onto something like this. I would like it, it to be like this, so that when I reflect, I get a complete surface. But I, it could happen that something like this happens. Even though it is embedded, then the surface projects onto points that uh, cover the North Pole. Then, when even though it is embedded, when I reflect, it will be no longer embedded in the reflection. So, in order to avoid this, what I do is the, is the following. Well, if h is bigger than one half, then the h sphere, with lambda is equals uh, pi over two, doesn't go over the North Pole because I, I, I know it explicitly. This is related to, to, the, to the two tangent h spheres that I, 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 was, I was describing in the first video. So by monotonicity, these two curves, h1 and h2, doesn't go over the North Pole, North Pole either. Then, also, there cannot be interior points that running over the North Pole because then at points projecting onto this North Pole, I would have that uh, the, the, the function u is zero because the uh, vector field x is zero on the North Pole and the South Pole. So then I would get a contradiction. So the picture is more or less like, like this. And then if the length of h0 is a multiple of, uh, sorry, an integer divisor of pi, 
then I would get a compact embedded H torus when I reflect uh, with respect to the vertical planes containing H1 and H2. So I will finish by showing this modular space of, of surfaces and it is described in terms of two parameters. On the one hand, the mean curvature H, and on the other hand, the, the number of, half of the number of times I need to repeat the fundamental piece to complete the whole equation. I say a half of the number of times because, well, at least uh, the, 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 the number of pieces I need to complete the equator is even because I need to reflect once to get rid, for instance, of H1, and then I have two components equal to H2, and then I can uh, repeat this surface, this surface as many times as, as, I, as I want. So I need an even number of, 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 of uh, fundamental pieces. But in fact, this uh, parameter is a real number because maybe the surface doesn't close in, the, in, a, in an integer number of uh, repetitions. So well, the, the picture is like this. On the, on, the, on the bottom we have the cylinders that corresponds, uh, to, correspond to this uh, relation between the mean curvature and the number of, of, of times I need to repeat the, the surface. Then I have undoloids, then I get the spheres, and then I get the nodoids. So, here I would like to recall, or I would like to, 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 to spot where the compact embedded examples lie. And they lie at these horizontal dotted lines. Why? Well, because they correspond, they correspond to the integer values of m, which means that I close in the first turn around the equator with a finite number of copies of the fundamental piece. Well, in this, in each of these horizontal, one parameter continuous, one parameter families of embedded tori, I have two limits. On the one half, half I, on the one hand, I have the cylinders, and on the other half, I hand, I have these blue dots that correspond to stacks of m tangent uh, CMC spheres that are tangent and they are all uh, evenly distributed along the equator. Again, I have the minimum value one half that corresponds to the limit of the family and here I find again the limit of two tangent one half spheres. As a final comment, I will say that this picture looks like the picture of invariant Delaunay H surfaces in S2 cross R. But here we are dealing only with a horizontal direction. So my expectation is that these are the only uh, compact embedded H tori in S2 cross R. So thank you very much for your attention and well, I, I hope you, you make a lot of questions. Thanks.